Buenos días a todos, bienvenidos eh, a Casa Árabe, en una eh, actividad que en este caso tiene eh, dos aspectos que interesan especialmente a Casa Árabe, en cuanto que se va a tratar of interest to Casa Árabe for two reasons. We're going to be dealing with gender-related issues and social and economic issues to which we haven't paid as close attention. With the OECD, we're going to be presenting the report Women's Economic Empowerment in MENA Countries. I'm not going to go into the substance because the other speakers will be doing that, and the other speakers are the Secretary of State of International Cooperation for Ibero-America, Fernando García Casas, thank you for being here, the Director of uh, the Spanish International Cooperation Agency, Luis Tejada, and the author of the report, the coordinator, Carlos Conde from the OECD, and he will be our first speaker today. Let me give the floor to the director of the International Cooperation Agency in Spain. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank Casa Árabe for having organized this event and for having invited us here. And I also wanted to introduce Carlos Conde in the OECD and uh, the work the OECD, the OECD is doing in uh, the southern Mediterranean countries. I met Carlos Conde when uh, he had just begun his tenure as uh, OECD, as ambassador to the OECD. He was hired to boost the OECD MENA program which had recently been set up. Uh, Secretary General Gurria had promoted it. From the very beginning, we had very, um, a very good relation, and I have to praise what the OECD is doing. He's working at the Secretariat with Mr. Gurria, and I have to commend the work done in uh, the MENA area at first. Mm, the MENA meetings had ambitious programs with a lot of issues, but were mid-management level meetings, and now they've become a set of uh, major cooperation activities. For instance, the reform program introduced by Morocco under, or rather with the support of the OECD, and that was done at the request of the Moroccan government. So the OECD has uh, become a benchmark for developing countries. And I think uh, Secretary General Gurria played a major role. I remember the debates at the OECD. Some OECD countries, including those working with um, developing countries were reluctant. For instance, Nordic countries, they said that they had, there were other organizations for that and that the OECD was a club for uh, developed countries and best practices. The OECD accounts for 60% of global GDP and it played a major role in the economy and it plays a major role in the economy but it has to include emerging and developing countries, uh, middle-income countries. And we've uh, seen middle-income countries join the OECD, and we now have a very tight network of relations with third countries uh, that go even beyond candidate countries, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Peru, Costa Rica have applied to join the OECD. Mexico and Chile are already members. So Secretary General Gurria has made the OECD uh, much more attractive and forward-looking. And I wanted to mention the work the OECD uh, did under Carlos Conde's uh, supervision. It's very interesting uh, because of the substance, but also because uh, it's, uh, well, you see that with a tool, you can change things. 
The substance is interesting, the comparison among countries is interesting, and the way the report was drafted is also interesting. A professor uh, was asked to write it. There were working groups with private sector consultants as well as MPs and uh, civil society. And those working groups assess their country and manage to compare their countries with other countries. There is a lot of diversity in legislation and um, on, the, on the ground. So in addition to this comparison and uh, having so many people on board to draft the report, this report was uh, introduced in, uh, at a meeting in Cairo and there was an open discussion on this issue, which uh, years ago was considered to be highly sensitive, the role of uh, women, the status of women in the family and so on. And in this case, uh, core issues on women have been debated. They've been debated in public and uh, there has been agreement on the need for reforms. So regardless of the situation, in each country, the political and democratic situation in each country, there seems uh, to be a current, an underlying a current for reform uh, throughout the region, and uh, this is highlighted by this report. Thank you. Let me give the floor to the Secretary of State. Muchas gracias. Tiene la palabra el Secretario de Estado de Cooperación Internacional y para Iberoamérica. The Secretary of State for International Cooperation and for Ibero-America has the floor. Good morning. I'd like to thank the Director of Casa Arabe and the Director of the Spanish Cooperation, International Cooperation Office for being here. The Director mentioned uh, the value of this report. I've been reading it uh, in the last few days, and I've not only learned a lot, but I'm very impressed by the quality of uh, the report. It's taken three years to draft this report. It's been drafted together with uh, civil society experts, government officials, and it addresses lots of uh, issues regarding uh, family law and personal status. And this uh, includes equality. The 2030 Agenda and the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals were signed by uh, every country. And there are four objectives, two objectives, uh, objectives four and five, education for all and gender equality, that are intertwined. And uh, if this is a commitment undertaken by all humankind, southern Mediterranean countries can't be an exception. Inequality is one of the main obstacles to growth. And as the former Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, said for the 2030 agenda, we we are all developing countries, so I think that this report and this event are a way to show our solidarity. We're a Mediterranean country, and over the past few decades we've made great strides, and we have to continue making them in the area of gender equality. In the report, we can see that there is room for improvement in these countries, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Libya, Jordan, and Egypt. The percentage of women in the workforce is still low. There is a salary gap between men and women, but that's something that we suffer from here too. There is uh, the informal economy, and the informal economy not only affects the rights of workers, but it also affects public policies uh, because of um, tax collection. And also, women, female entrepreneurship is still very low. And you need to add to that um, sexual harassment, harassment in work, at work, and in transportation, uh, in the means of transportation, and that happens in Hollywood too. Regarding transportation, ICED is uh, cooperating in an initiative called Safe Cities, which will allow women to uh, be protected from uh, harassment. 
both in parks and in the means of transportation, and we're working on this project in Mexico City and Guatemala, among others. Constitutional changes are also important. After the Arab Springs, the, the Arab Spring, we saw changes uh, in constitutions. Those constitutional changes now have to trickle down into legislation, and legislation needs to be implemented because sometimes there is a gap between uh, legislation and what happens on the ground. Women have to be aware of their rights, and that's why we have Objective 4, education. And once they're aware of their rights, they have to be able to access uh, courts to exercise uh, and to exercise their rights. The issues regarding family law and progress made in marriage, divorce, the right to property, inheritance law, and the freedom to leave the house and to uh, pass on women's citizenship. All that is very interesting. So, it's not only about identifying uh, problems based on reliable statistics, it's also about what to do about those problems. Legislative changes are very important, but societies need to evolve uh, towards more respectful and equal uh, societies. And as the IC director was saying, over the past 30 years, gender has always been a cross-cutting issue in Spain's cooperation policy, whatever the government. Since 2012, the IACID has a regional program called uh, Gender and Women within a, the Masar Gender Program after the changes, political changes that took place in the Arab world. And we continue to have that program, and we're now developing a gender strategy for the Middle East and Northern Africa. And uh, those are the same objectives pursued by the OECD in its report, combating violence against women and uh, introducing legislative uh, changes and promoting equality in legislation. We're not alone. We have the support of the Complutense University, uh, the Judges Council, and the Arab uh, Women Legal Group, and also uh, a group of women judges committed, who are committed to those countries and to uh, promoting equality. And we also have the cooperation of IACID and the OECD in Tunisia, Morocco, and in regional government governance programs. I think it's very interesting to hold this event today because, as uh, you know, uh, the November 25th is uh, the day against gender violence. And the Human Rights Day is also coming up. According uh, to figures, 20% of women aged between 15 and 49 have been the subject of sexual violence, and half of uh, the homicides of women are caused by their partners or husbands, and this happens in the developing world and in the developed world. And since we're all Mediterranean countries, I think it's important to say we can get further if we sail together. So uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Jordan, Libya, and Egypt should consider Spanish cooperation and the OECD as friends, partners, and allies to continue sailing together against this human tragedy. Thank you. Eh, muchas gracias, Secretario. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. We are now going to be presenting the report. Carlos Conde will be presenting the report together with Licola Ellerman, who is responsible for the program on uh, competitiveness. Uh, from the MENA region and the OECD, and Nora Alim, who's come from Cairo to be with us today. We also have uh, the ambassadors of Tunisia, 
Tunisia has uh, changed its legislation to promote gender equality, and uh, that's a reason of great hope for the Arab world and for all of us all. And also the ambassador from the Arab League is here with us too. Sí, eh, buenos días, señores y señoras, el señor secretario de Estado, director de Casa Árabe, muchas gracias por que se está asociada tan cariñosa y tan entusiasta al trabajo de la OECD. Nos ha emocionado mucho contar con su apoyo, que desde luego ha sido fundamental en todo el trabajo de la OECD. Su apoyo ha sido clave para nuestro trabajo, y a mí, como Luis estaba diciendo, cuando empezamos hace unos años, esto fue un desafío significativo, porque la OECD no tenía nada de eso, porque la OECD no tenía nada de eso, porque la OECD the lack of experience with uh, emerging and developing economies, but some uh, visionary countries, among them Spain, realized rightly that Arab countries were middle-income countries with great economic potential and that it was necessary to start working with them through the OECD's traditional method, the best practices method, international standards, uh, through gaining knowledge of the economy and society through statistics by measuring so that the quality of public policies and their impact could be as effective as possible. And um, we started modestly, but uh, we were ambitious from the outset, and uh, as the years of the past, we've consolidated this dialogue based process, cooperation based process, and also an empirical knowledge process. And, uh, also by measuring information. That's always the starting point for the OECD in order to diagnose and provide the right public policy responses to the social and economic needs. This is uh, one of the concerns behind our work on gender in the Arab world. But this materializes in another concern at the OECD, equality between men and women in OECD countries. That's a top priority for the OECD. For a decade, uh, Secretary General Gurria has put women's issues at the core of the OECD's concerns. In 2013, there was a re recommendation approved on gender equality in different areas, education, economy, entrepreneurship, and we started measuring in OECD countries what women's status was in the different areas analyzed by the OECD. And the results were very disappointing. First, it was very difficult to uh, measure the situation of women. But as we improved our measuring, we realized that the gap in OECD countries, which supposedly are advanced economies, the gap was huge. This year, we uh, launched this report, the Battle for Equality. It's an uphill battle. Uh, and the uh, report measures the most salient facts. And let me share with you some of the information in that report. In OECD countries, under one-third of company managers are women. Mothers have 23% less chances of finding a job than fathers. The average of women in full employment is 15% in OECD countries. And this is for full employment because we know that women are employed part-time much more than men. And women have 11% less chances of having a paid job. This is uh, well known, and we know that uh, in politics, women are underrepresented. Underrepresented, only 29% 
of MPs in OECD countries are women, and as uh, far as um, top jobs in um, government jobs, only 33% of those jobs are held by women in OECD countries. This is, uh, as I was saying, figures. On, these are figures on the OECD. Measuring this is difficult, and in the Arab world, there is a serious problem with accessing data and being able to measure the situation. The OECD's concern is mainly economic, and what this shows is that societies where women aren't fully integrated in the economy lose a great deal of potential for competitiveness and wealth creation. Turning to the Arab world now, Economic, women's economic empowerment is one of our major concerns, and when we talk about women's economic empowerment, we refer to different things. Uh, the ability of women to be independent and autonomous, having access to jobs, and having the ability of uh, setting up a company and having their own economic activity. When we talk about employment, it's important to differentiate public and private employment. We know that women in the Arab world tend to work in the public sector. But and rather don't tend to work in the private sector. And there are few female entrepreneurs in the Arab world. But before giving you specific figures on the economic situation of Arab women, it's important to give you the uh, backdrop of the role of women in Arab uh, in the Arab world's economies. So let me talk about the economic context in general. Here you have the growth rate of uh, different regions in the world. The OECD is in blue, and we have other emerging economies, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Middle East, which is the red line. What I'd like to highlight here is that a decade ago, the Arab uh, world had good growth rates, 5-6%. They were hard hit by the global financial crisis, but they were even harder hit by political instability as of 2011, and now the region is growing at very at a very low rate compared to its job creation needs. The Arab economies aren't very dynamic because these economies are not very diversified. Uh, many of these countries focus on natural resources and other countries haven't diversified their economy enough to uh, be part of the global economy. Here we see the low rate of diversification in Arab economies, and the result of that is that the private sector is weak. These economies have a large public sector, and usually the private sector is informal, it's small, and it's not able to create jobs. Here we have other indicators that show the lack of dynamism of the private sector. Here you see the lowest, in the Arab world, you have the lowest rate of entrepreneurship, which is something which helps the economy grow. It's important to understand um, this uh, concept, to understand what the situation of Arab women is. Women suffer from uh, the same difficulties as women in other regions when it comes to discrimination, cultural patterns and so on. And women here also face a more difficult economic environment in general. But what we've noticed is that it's um, twice as difficult for women than it is for men. Economic empowerment, integration of women in the economy in the Arab world, those rates are among the lowest in the world. And and 
you have to wonder why, and you have to wonder what the reasons for that are and how uh, those reasons can be addressed to change the situation. And what we see also is that change is possible, and that's the good news. Here you have information on the uh, trends in education in the Arab world, and what we see is that over the last decade, the educational level of women has grown significantly. Uh, sometimes results are exceptional in Gulf countries, for instance, the access to tertiary education is uh, among the highest in the world. And among women in, Gulf, uh, in the countries in the Gulf. So the educational level is high, but that doesn't mean that women's participation in the labor market is high. This also happens in our countries, but in the Arab world, it is much more striking. Here you have a comparison between Arab countries covered by the report and OECD countries and other emerging um, countries because you have to compare uh, countries that are similar. So you have here China, India, Indonesia. Uh, here you can see that uh, the rate of women's participation in the labor market is extremely low in the Arab world. And if we compare between men and women, uh, per age group, we can see how large this gap is. Employment is a general problem, both for women and for men in the Arab world, but it's a much more serious problem for women, especially young women, whose unemployment rate is extremely high, 64.8% in Egypt, 47% is the average for the MENA region, and in a country like Jordan, that's also the figure. So the figures shows, show us the gap between men and women, and we see that young women are in a particularly difficult situation, women who ironically have a, a very high level of education. This has to be linked not only with uh, the discrimination women suffer from, but also it needs to be linked to the lack of dynamism in Arab economies and the low potential for growth. This low dynamism is also due to a lack of skills, and often um, skills, uh, also the problem is also that the skills that are taught by the educational system. So we have a huge amount of women who are educated but who are not contributing to the economy and they are therefore reinforcing this vicious circle of lack of growth and lack of competitiveness. And the same applies to entrepreneurship and, and to company establishment. Female entrepreneurs well, we shouldn't see them as uh, high class or uh, middle class women. Um, they play a major role in agriculture, hotels, setting up small companies. All of this contributes to fighting poverty, but we see that in the Arab countries there are few female entrepreneurships. At the OECD, we've um, worked on this for several years. We've tried to analyze this issue from different perspectives. I have here several publications, one on women in public life, where we look at women's political participation, and we've also looked at the institutions promoting equality in the Arab world. And here, there are good news, too, because um, Arab countries have taken steps 
to promote equality. Almost all countries have uh, institutions, ministries uh, for equality and so on. They have strategies. They have legislation promoting uh, equality. Of course, it's difficult for those policies to have an impact, but at least they have ambitious objectives. We started working on free female entrepreneurship and we have several publications on this topic as well. But when we looked at the causes and why women in the Arab world encounter these problems, well, we realized that law is very important and legal discriminations are very important. And that concern led us to draft this report at a very specific point in time during the Arab revolutions, at a time when a lot of countries were amending their constitutions and their legal framework. And we thought that it was important to have the gender perspective on those reforms. And my colleagues are going to refer to uh, this concern, but the message, the message was, uh, which is a, a, a tough message, is that in general, throughout the world, women suffer from uh, discrimination, wage discrimination, violence, and so on, but legal discrimination doesn't exist in many countries. Uh, many countries have abolished legal discrimination. And the Arab countries are no exception, but in spite of these efforts, discrimination persists and that has a major economic impact. That was uh, the uh, gist of the report and my colleagues are going to be providing more information. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Nicola Elemann. Uh, I uh, have worked on uh, gender aspects in the MENA region ever since 2008 and 2009. I'm very honored to be here this morning. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great opportunity to present uh, this report, and I'm very ex impressed by the very thorough reading um, that the State Secretary did of it and of its initial presentation. Um, I must pay a tribute to Spain not only for inviting us this morning, but overall the program um, in which I'm active uh, was led at some point uh, by Spain, and uh, Luis Tejada was in Paris at that time, and I think that, that all Spain very much impulsed uh, the consideration uh, on uh, the aspect of gender equality in, in, in the framework of that program and, and the mainstreaming aspect. And when we initiated it, we didn't really know how to go about it. And so we initiated the work in our part of uh, the program, which is about economic development, competitiveness, establishing um, economic environment for private sector development in the MENA region. We started off by working indeed on women um, in, um, as um, uh, entrepreneurs. Though when we did our analysis and we saw that there were things in place in order to support them, yet we see these figures where the economic development doesn't take off. And so we started by wondering whether there was an interaction between the interplay of economics and, and, and legal aspects. So I have to recognize the tribute of Spain. I also have to recognize the tribute of Sweden, who very much supported us. I have to recognize the tribute of men, because we cannot achieve any change without you on board, and we need uh, you to buy in into this discussion. And I cannot do, we couldn't have done this work without the collaboration of many people in our networks that we actively involved, including from the League of Arab States, for instance, but also in the countries, members of the League of Arab States and with whom we collaborate through our program. So this publication is indeed the outcome of a project that was first initiated with the changes in most of the countries um, in the beginning of uh, 2000, after 2010, and th who had one common concern that was to drive towards a transition. We did a hearing and we wanted to find out whether it was worth going into this direction and examining 
the legal impact. And we came out with the observations of many that was MPs, civil society, pub uh, public officials saying, yes, we want to know better about the situation. And so this is then the result of the work of um, all these people together uh, who in a period of transition wanted to look on the one hand um, into what uh, countries um, were doing towards gender equality and non-discrimination um, within themselves. We analyzed the overall architecture of law, starting with the constitution over family law, labor law, um, business law, tax law, and other provisions. So we have an examination of the countries in their coherent manner. But then we also looked into a country comparison between the con six countries that are part of our report, that is Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Libya, Morocco, and Tunisia. And eventually the idea was not to do a legal analysis because um, although that's very <coughs> difficult to do, uh, the legal aspects per se may not be the expression of what we were looking for. What we wanted to understand is really what is the economic impact of these different elements. And um, we, we come to recognize that the countries have done um, a lot of efforts and also impressive uh, progress. Um, Carlos mentioned the aspect of education. And even there we said, how comes these progress have been made? Because sometimes we hear, yes, legislation is in place, but legislation is not implemented, and the legislation doesn't have really impact. Now, how comes the countries have made the change? Because there was a change in legislation. And education has picked up because the legal aspects were changed and that it was education for all girls and boys. So that's at the margin, but I need to say it because we ha law matters. I'm not a lawyer, my father was a lawyer, but so law matters, and changing the law matters. That's one thing. Um, the other thing that's very important is that the countries, of the, the countries that we examine here all have subscribed to international standards, all have international commitments towards equality and non-discrimination. And it's an important element because this is where you can start with. And the second very important aspect is that the constitutional changes that have been made ever since 2010 in Morocco in 2011, Tunisia, 2014, Egypt the same year, um, the fundamental amendment in the constitution in Jordan or in Algeria and the provisional constitutional declaration of Libya all refer to the principle of equality and non-discrimination. And so that's a very good starting point. Now, the constitutions not all refer in the same manner to gender equality and non-discrimination. So here we can already see that maybe some can be more progressive than others. But all have it. And starting from there, then you must say, also in all the countries, the constitutions have the highest level of law, meaning that the constitutional provisions should in fact trigger down uh, into all the other parts of the legislation in a coherent manner. So it's a very good starting point and from there you can develop more. Now you may say it may take time. And indeed what we then find is that um, there are provisions that are embedded in the institutional commit in the cons in the international commitments in the constitutional that have not yet triggered down into the different pieces of legislation, and this is where it then becomes very important, um, <clears throat> because um, and 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 Nora here present with us and who has led the work in Egypt uh, and who is a family law expert has brought a lot of recognition to us on the impact of the family law into the whole apparatus of uh, the legislative and then also the social um, and, and implementation aspects of, of the region. And we will, she will debate that better. But um, from, uh, that, from here, I think we, what we, we should say is that um, the family law matters a lot and that it, there is a strong interplay with other laws, that some countries have started amending the family law, and one very important amendment is, for instance, that some countries have done away with women's obligations to obedience, but some countries still maintain it. And although countries have done away with the concept of obedience, um, uh, the, the, this may still exist in, in, in the social minds. Um, and, and because it still exists in the social minds, there is 
something that remains that is the burden of care. And some other institutions, but others have evaluated how many hours women spend more than men in the care of their children, of the elderly, of the family. And then what we also find in the family law is that women are not at par with men in decision making in the family. Um, they don't have, in some countries, due precisely to the obligation of obedience, uh, the same rights to pursue a profession, to travel, to marry, to divorce, to head or lead a family, um, to receive an inheritance, or to have access to wealth. And um, I think there are a major difference between the countries, which will deserve to be looked at in more detail. Um, but, uh, and we can discuss that also later. But what has struck me as a woman now, I can speak with my heart sometimes, is that the interaction of all these little provisions, which may independently look not so important, but when you take them together in some countries, are extremely frightening. That means that you are in a position of um, um, insecurity. Because if you if you're disobedience, maybe your man, husband can divorce from one day to the next, and you may find yourself without any piece of wealth. And if you haven't worked, because your husband was telling you that you were not allowed to leave the house, then the result may be that you're in a very, very deep situation of stress, finding yourself without anything, if you don't have children in low age to educate and stay in the house, because you may have to go back to your parents or be in the street. This is a very bleak scenario, but I mean to say it because if you don't think it through, you don't find uh, where, where, where the difficulty lies. Now, um, to take a, a pass away from that, um, I think that um, we also see that although there are differences, these family law provisions ha have an interplay on society, including through the labor laws and the labor codes. Um, now, we have to recognize all the six countries refer in their labor law to non-discrimination and to equality, and also to uh, equality for pay. And when we started uh, the work in the countries, because we did build on desk research of the law, but we also went into discussions in the six countries with target groups. These target groups were students, but there were also entrepreneurs, there were people in remote areas, and there were handicraft workers. So we tested uh, the perceptions and the, uh, um, the way people were living their lives and what they were animated by. Um, we found out that de facto um, equality of pay is not a reality. And then when you look, when you start looking, you see that the ILO shows that there is not equality. But the overall belief is that there is equality, but de facto it is not. Now, what, why is, do you see here uh, differences also? It is that the social norms and in, in attitudes are very much informed by the gender-based regulations, be that either the family law or the labor law. So when it comes to um, labor law, uh, for instance, parental benefits are biased in favor of women. Only women can get parental uh, benefits. But that comes with obligations for the employer. So non-salary benefits um, only favor men. Uh, retirement provisions and income taxes make it more expensive for firms, all this together makes it more expensive for a firm to employ a woman. Um, and um, so pay, pay, uh, play an important role in labor market decisions. That means that, um, uh, for instance, you have uh, protective laws, laws that are very well meant Women shouldn't work at night. Women shouldn't work in certain sectors. Women should not do certain things that are not in favor of, of, of them. Yet, if you take all these elements together, um, then an employer may consider that employing a woman is really labor, is very burdensome 
creates a lot of expenses, creates not much flexibility. And eventually he will hire a man, he will promote a man, um, and uh, so you find that you have a more male-dominated economy, at least in the formal economy. Um, the fact that women are lowly represented in the formal economy, that they also leave uh, due to their family obligations at a certain point in time, uh, the employment market or are not recruited or leave also for early retirement, which is a very protective way of seeing that women can leave early, um, has a consequence on uh, decision-making positions and on corporate boards. So you find very little, if any, women um, in, in these positions. Um, however, uh, we see and we will need certainly to make more examinations of that, that women are much more likely to work in the informal economy. Now, we have seen that women are very well educated, so there is no reason for women to be themselves in the informal economy. Uh, but there are these factors that play uh, um, in favor of, of them maybe being recruited in the informal economy, even by a formal employer who may consider that certain provisions that are to be paid for women or put in place for women, such as childcare in the company, uh, may lead them to recruit them as an informal employee in their formal, in their formal um, uh, enterprise. Um, but then um, you may also have uh, women that uh, are more home-based, self-employed, uh, so these are small companies that don't necessarily lead to lots of productivity gains, competitiveness of the countries, etc. So overall, uh, informal employment, I think, uh, like, Ms. like the Secretary of State mentioned, has an impact not only on the lives of the people, but also has a very strong impact on the income of the MENA countries' economies. Yet, when I now think as an economist, I would say with this whole interplay, I'm a little bit provocative and we can discuss that later, maybe if I am a family and my husband can go into formal employment and he can have the, non, the salary, the bigger salary, and the non-salary benefits as the head of household, um, then why wouldn't it be an advantage for my wife to play a role in the informal economy? Maybe it's better for a couple to be like that, provided, of course, that, uh, these, that the economies are still constantly constituted of couples because what happens with divorce, what happens with women that are not married, these are the elements that are not so, so clear and which we wanted to research, and Carlos very much insisted on these aspects. Um, but we found limits due to data limitations. So this is something that we need to, to engage more. Um, and then finally, on establishing a business, managing a business, the principle of gender neutrality is completely provided uh, by uh, the legislation, uh, but we find that Women are facing gender-specific obstacles to business development, ranging from access to finance, which brings us back to inheritance or um, family law arrangement, business registrations and freedom of movement, all that has a, an impact. Um, and then women face additional challenges in business registration and licensing procedures. Um, their lack of work experiences, their lack of network, access to networks, and their difficulties in identifying and physically accessing relevant agencies also have to be taken into account. And eventually the structures for women ent entrepreneurs are still insufficient um, and information on them per se is a little bit scarce. Uh, and then there is, of course, also what uh, was mentioned earlier, the issue of uh, security to and from work, and then the security at work. There have been very much changes undergone 
recently in, for women in the public space. Some countries have also legislations in place on sexual harassment in the workplace, yet normally it applies only to the employer and not necessarily to the employees around you or to the customers of the company, and you hear a lot here. Now, um, I'm, I'm sorry to be a little bit late, but I would like to mention that uh, we have held national consultations in Jordan with uh, Salma Nims, the Secretary General of the National Commission of uh, Women in April, in Tunisia with Her Excellency uh, uh, Nezia Labidi, the Minister of Women's Affairs in Morocco, with His Excellency uh, um, Lassen Daoudi, Minister of Governance and General Affairs, who all organized national consultations. Uh, we have national consultations ahead in, with Libya on the 4th of December, uh, in Tunisia with Algeria and Egypt, they are planned, um, and we will hold them in the beginning of next year. Uh, what these multi-stakeholder uh, consultations led to was that uh, most of uh, the participants underlined the importance of the work already carried out and, and um, valued the, the analysis. Um, they all underlined also the need um, to, to, to have a better understanding um, on the women's economic participation because starter is uh, very scarce yet still to, to make an overall assessment. Um, they uh, underlined the predominance of uh, the women's informal employment and called for a much better understanding um, of the extent and the impact of women's participation in this informal sector. Uh, going forward, they also stressed the importance of furthering women's economic empowerment through regulatory reform. They, they think that it is very important that this be done. Um, and. Um, all against the background that there are these national differences. So national groups would look into national specificities here and we don't have the time to develop what they are. Um, they suggested the launch of national multi-stakeholder monitoring groups, which the OECD could be backing and also because we have this capacity of convening power um, and a certain neutrality maybe, um, in order to support gender uh, responsive laws and working relations throughout sectors. What we find also, for instance, indeed in, in, in the report, is that in certain countries, certain sectors of work are not covered by the labor law. Um, and that, of course, impl implies automatically that if these sectors are made mostly women-dominated, such as agriculture, uh, or for instance housework, although this has been amended in Morocco, then people remain in informality because the, the, the sector doesn't fall under it. Um, examine the possibility to introduce also flex time arrangements or part-time arrangements. Um, develop policies to ensure that the private sector is committed to proper representation of women on boards. I think this is very much a, a discussion ongoing in all the countries. Um, and to have a better understanding of the interplay between the social context and the legal frameworks. This is uh, particularly requested in countries such as Morocco and Tunisia at uh, the regional level, the sub-regional level, because you see that there are differences between the region. Not everything is applied in the same manner, for instance, in Tunisia between the coast and then the, the back part of the country. Um, and then there was also, uh, I think, uh, the, 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 the trial to do this discussion over the interplay of different uh, provisions um, led in the discussion to the demand that there be in these groups more consideration being paid to the reforms that you can do in one area and then think also over what it means in another area and how do things play out eventually if you take them from a more horizontal point of view. And then also we know that legislative changes may take long and sometimes they may not be necessarily possible. And one aspect that's very important, and I will end with this, is to also look for good practices. And not only within the region, but well beyond. And um, I think that people occasionally know what's going on in their own country, not always. 
But, uh, so I'm very much in favor of SDG uh, point 0.4 uh, on education, awareness raising, etc. But together with that is also that people don't know what's going on at home if they know it's good, but then they don't know what's going on elsewhere, and that you can actually do things in a different manner. For instance, in one of these consultations in Egypt, I was talking about the impact of the inheritance law, and a very senior, very well-educated lady at some point said to me, but what are the inheritance provisions in other countries? Well, if you don't know that you can do it differently, how can you imagine them? So I think that a collection of good practices is very important. And so for the Women's Day uh, in 2018 in uh, the OECD, um, or the day before, I should say the 7th, we are organizing now between different regional programs that we have in our OECD on Latin America, uh, on uh, Southeast Asia, Southeast Europe, uh, Eurasia, a whole day where we will seek to find good practices among different regions, including Muslim regions, but not from the MENA region, to identify how did you go about changes in case you were not able to do the legislative changes or the legislative changes were taken later on. So, and I think with this, I, I will uh, stop my presentation. I'm happy to take more questions and hand over to, to Nora, who needs to access the computer. Good morning. It's a great honor for me to participate today in this meeting and to speak to you not only as one of the contributors um, of, to the OECD publication at hand, but also as a former legal research associate in the Max Planck Institute for Comparative and International Private Law in Germany, where I worked with other experts on the family laws of Muslim countries and the perspectives of reform in these countries. And um, um, in my, my, my research at the Max Planck Institute dealt um, uh, mainly with the differences and similarities of challenges in reforming the law and equalizing the position of women in the law within MENA countries. Some countries managed to take already bold steps in gender equalities. Other countries still manifest broad discriminations within the legislation. But discriminative uh, family law impacts, of course, the whole functioning of a society. A disempowered woman within the family is not empowered as an employee, as a taxpayer, or a banking client. Disempowerment within the position of the family influences the whole conduct in society. In the MENA region, marriage has a significant um, um, importance in the society. Women uh, mostly gain status as a, as a um, wife and as a mother. But on the other side, the, um, the divorce rate is quite high in these, in these countries and fails to protect broadly women um, in, uh, in, in their legal rights upon divorce. And also the um, um, informality of marriages is quite widespread and also here there is no legal um, regulations um, protecting women in those situations. In what follows I would like to pay um, part, um, some particular attention to some discriminative laws in the in the family laws in these six countries. Um, I will talk a little bit about the duty of obedience within marriage, about um, polygamy, property rights within marriage, divorce um, within marriage, divorce rights, and inheritance rights. So, um, all of these countries still maintain specific um, marital rights and duties for men and women. Um, women have, in general, different rights and duties within the family than men. Um, and 
in some countries, even the, um, the um, principle of obedience still is maintained, which means that the woman, the wife has to pay obedience to her husband whilst the um, husband has in exchange pay maintenance to the woman. And um, this concept, <laughs> This concept and, and, and the fact that there are still a distinction between um, the rights of, of men and women in, in the family laws um, lead to the situation that the broad um, number of families in the MENA countries still um, live according to a traditional family image where the, mother, where the wife is taking the role of the caregiver whilst the husband as the head of the family is um, mainly responsible for maintaining the family. Mm, and um, in this situation, um, a couple of um, further um, discriminative aspects are, um, are creating a threat to women. For example, um, the right of polygamy, which still exists in all countries except uh, Tunisia um, is a threat to the material and emotional well-being of women. All countries try to limit um, this right, um, but in principle it still exists. Another um, Further, the, um, further um, the separation of property can create um, a, um, a discrimination for women because um, a woman who, according to the um, traditional family image, does not um, follow up a paid work, will not um, earn any money um, during marriage. And if the... If the um, if the joint, if, if the, if the um, marital uh, regime uh, is based on separation of property, she is totally at the, um, dependent on the um, goodwill of the husband upon uh, divorce and, um, yeah, and will not have any, uh, any own assets. So, um, yeah, so this, um, according to the traditional family image, the separation of property in the MENA countries are quite um, un, um, un, uh, um, yeah, not, not profitable for women. Some countries try to, um, to limit this uh, or to, to, to promote uh, the community of property in order to um, to give women more financial um, autonomy uh, through uh, in introducing legislation where the uh, couple can agree on, on the community of property. But still, the prin in principle, if the, if the, um, if the um, spouses do not agree on, um, on anything, the separation of property um, rules. But still, um, the Maghreb um, countries especially uh, managed uh, through this kind of legislation to promote the idea and to raise the awareness within the society to, um, that this is also a, a possibility. Uh, in Egypt and Jordan on the other side, and also in Libya, there, there is not such a legislation and there's also um, nearly no awareness about this um, possibility of, of um, agreeing on this um, um, on this um, uh, on, on separation uh, on, on community of property. Um, So I'm sorry, I forgot, um, I forgot these, um, this slide, which is still uh, um, going um, back to the obedient maintenance um, contract within marriage. So in, um, 
in Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, and Libya, as, as I uh, mentioned, the duty of obedience was abolished, but still um, um, the, um, there are specific uh, male and female um, duties within the, uh, within the family. Um, but um, Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria um, um, reached the point that the maintenance of the family is a shared um, duty, which, uh, which changes, of course, the position of, of the wife in the family. On the other side, in Egypt and Jordan, um, legal regulations still uh, manifest the duty of obedience. And disobedience in this terms mean that uh, if a woman leaves the house without the approval of the husband or she follows um, a work which is against the approval of the husband and he can um, prove that it's um, against the family's interest, she might be deemed as um, disobedient. And this might um, risk her right of maintenance, and it also weakens her position in a divorce, um, in a divorce um, litigation. Um, the divorce rights in um, in all countries are also consisting some um, some problems. Um, Especially in Libya, Egypt, and Jordan, where we there, where, where still um, the unconditional right of divorce is upheld, and uh, what is also very problematic, um, the um, divorce can be um, s um, declared outside of a court. So a husband can just um, go to a register, a register and. Um, and announce the divorce without without providing any reasons, um, and he even does not need to notify the wife. This is the duty of the registrar. Um, a woman, on the other side, needs to, if she wants to uh, seek, the, uh, if she seeks uh, for a divorce, she needs to to prove um, that she was um, she um, was harmed during the marriage because only if she can prove that she has suffered a harm, um, she is entitled to maintenance rights. And in practice, this is very problematic because um, especially divorce litigation takes up to several years um, in Egypt and Jordan where the woman is in a totally unclarified legal situation and does not have any, uh, any uh, security of um, what to expect on a financial basis. Um, in order to speed up this, um, this situation um, of insecurity, um, uh, um, a fast-track divorce was introduced, the so-called Hull divorce, but um, in that case she can um, claim for divorce also without having been suffered um, a a harm, which means she at least can exit a, um, a marriage which is harming to her, um, but she has um, to, to uh, forfeit all her financial rights. And um, in practice, this has become a quite um, practical tool for non-willingly for husbands who are not willing to pay maintenance because they um, often just um, don't cooperate in the litigation process by not um, appearing at the court sessions um, and, and, and make the um, proof of, of the harm um, even more difficult and at the end the woman feels um, pressured in fi filing a, div a whole divorce where she can at least just exit the, the, um, the marriage and clarify her legal status. So this, um, in t this, this uh, amendment, this law amendment which took place in 2000, there were some, um, um, the, the aim was to, um, to um, strengthen women's rights, but in practice it had become a bit counterproductive. 
Um, so, in general, uh, we have quite a um, difficult and threatening uh, situation for women. Um, according to the traditional family image, women often do not follow up paid work, as, as we have um, said um, before, which is, um, among others, also caused in the obedience maintenance contract within marriage and the traditional um, separation of um, contribution of roles in the marriage. Women also have a lesser um, access to, um, to financial assets, which is, um, among others, um, um, due to um, the fact that they um, inherit lesser shares than, um, than, than their husbands. And they also, um, um, and also according to the rule of separation of property, a non working a woman um, does um, um, does exit uh, or yeah or does um, um, remains in a situation where um, she is financially not empowered and in this situation um, the unconditional divorce rights of husbands or and also the deaths of the husband create an omnipresent um, risky situation for women and their children because they might end up um, they might end up uh, without uh, no financial support because even if um, a woman um, is divorced by her husband and he is in, um, he is um, he he is uh, ma uh, made responsible to um, pay maintenance. This maintenance um, payment never exceeds two years. And after these two years, uh, women are uh, without any financial um, support by their former husbands, and especially if they did not follow up any work uh, during marriage and they are in their middle ages, it's a completely um, difficult situation for them. So um, the maintenance we are talking about is always a very limited, um, limited, limited period. The other financial um, security women um, women have if they exit a marriage is the is the dower, which is paid partly upon marriage and partly uh, upon marriage dissolution. But um, there are also uh, several problems um, um, connecting to the, to to the dower. For first, it's. Um, socially um, expected that the woman uses this first payment of dower to furnish the family house. So it is not anymore understood as a financial security as it used to be in, uh, in the historic times. And um, the second is that due to the economic um, difficulties in the Arab world, there is um, and this is even before the before the um, revolutions, but after the revolutions, the, this became even even um, more uh, present. Um, there is a marriage crisis in the country. Um, people cannot afford to get married due to social expectations. What what because it's very clearly. Um, um, defined what needs to be paid by the husband and what needs to be paid by the woman, by the wife. So um, it's a financial um, tremendous burden to get married in, in, in the countries, which led to the fact that a lot of young people cannot afford simply to get married and the marriage is delayed and delayed. And if a marriage at one point finally takes place, women are not in a situation as they used to be in the history as well, um, that they really um, um, argue for their rights upon marriage um, uh, conclusion and, they, and that they, uh, in, in exercise of private autonomy, put in conditions into the marriage contract. So um, also the delayed dower, which should be a financial security upon um, dissolution of marriage or upon death of the husband. This um, dower is often um, registered with a very little amount. Um, so, um, and, and, and women are nowadays not in a situation where they really have um, a strong argument um, 
to, and it is also socially unaccepted because the, in the society the perception uh, maintains that the men anyway have to pay everything as the head of the household um, and, and, and uh, women are not entitled to ask for more. So um, the unconditional divorce rights create an omnipresent uh, um, um, danger within marriage. But there are some uh, promising developments in the countries. In Tunisia, or, uh, first and foremost, we hear that there are discussions to equalize the inheritance law in order to um, give men and women the same share. And also um, the marital um, prohibition uh, for women to marry outside the Islamic faith um, is reconsidered. These are very progressive steps um, which are so far not to be expected um, in any of the other countries and it's um, interesting to see how Tunisia will um, continue here. In Egypt um, there are nevertheless also some um, positives, positive steps and steps in the right direction. For example, um, the um, uh, the inheritance rights also here have been already amended. Um, this already is uh, taken into force. Um, it does not equalize the, um, the share. Uh, this is actually, um, um, Egypt is far away from, from this. But um, um, what this amendment is uh, targeting is that there are a lot of uh, female heirs who are deprived from their share altogether, even even if it is only half of, of the share of the of, 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 of the male hair, but they are um, deprived from it altogether. And this amendment is is targeting um, um, this discrimination and and is. Um, um, penalizing those who are um, um, taking the share who belongs to the to the female hair. Um, also, um, the president, President El Sisi, um, 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 earlier this year, proposed um, the amendment of the divorce law, and he wanted to um, equalize it as well, and to. Um, and to delete the unconditional uh, divorce rights of uh, husbands, but he was stopped by the Al Azhar institution, the highest religious um, institution in Egypt, and therefore this um, this proposal is not taken forward so far. And um, it seems that it is um, it does not it is not it, it will not be carried on in the near future. Um, but um, what is every now and then coming up in Egypt is the discussion of using the marriage contract as um, a device of private autonomy uh, in the conclusion of marriage. Um, as I have said, um, uh, for example, um, in order to state the, um, the dower, but also um, there is the possibility, although there is no legal um, rule for this, there is a possibility for women to put um, there, um, to put in the marriage contract that they have also an unconditional right of divorce. Um, they, and there is a lot of um, misunderstanding within the society because it is perceived by, by also by parliamentarians, for example, that if women uh, put this in, the, uh, in their marriage contract, they take this right from, from the husband, which is not the case. It's going, it is uh, meant to be a joint um, um, a right for both equally to um, translate it, it means to hold the marriage band. Um, but it is also here a very uncommon for women to really to fight this through and um, and uh, so it is, um, although it is a new um, development and there was a lot of um, discussions about this, um, when it comes to the marriage conclusion, women are face themselves in a very male-dominated environment uh, with the male fem um, marriage registrar, with the um, guardian of the woman who is 
often, um, who is not um, required, but often still present at the at the marriage conclusion, um, and and the and and the male and the and the male part of the of the um, as, um, the husband. So uh, women often have a bad uh, situation in really um, pushing through progressive. Um, regulations in the marriage contract. Yes, but in all countries under investigation, the national legislatures are concerned to introduce changes that would have a positive impact for families as well as for their individual members. And international cooperation and exchange of European examples can only have a positive impact here. So I think um, I will stop here and I'm happy to um, discuss anything further. <laughs>